that I, I uh, it was it was an um, it was an immense task to try just to get it together, and then I realized there was far too much and tried to reduce it, and I reduced it, and it was still eighty slides, and so I've reduced it further, and uh, you can be assured that for every example, and you'll see you can't make some of this stuff up. Um, there, there's at least two or three equally egregious examples, but my intent is to, well, uh, and I'll I'll start sharing my slides in a moment is to basically, because of this, I'm just going to present data, if, in other examples. The, I'm not going to present analysis. I'm going to go through, I'm going to try to organize it, as you'll see, under a, a, a framework. And then, and so, so uh, and that should go, uh, you know, I haven't done it before, but, but I'm hoping it'll go in slightly under an hour, and that'll give a half an hour for people to talk about. Ivan's pointed out people like to interrupt, and that's fine with me too. Um, but my intent is really not to not to uh, uh, present much commentary, but just uh, lots of examples framed in a context that I hope will make it clear. So let me let me try and share the screen now and uh, and see if that works. And I think it has. You can all see this this black hole right here. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. So that's the title of the of of the um, of the of the seminar that uh, and uh, and. Um, the, I put it as a black hole because, first of all, I like to talk about black holes, but secondly, um, it may be a, I think it's a black hole that we tend to fall in and one hopes that we can, we won't have passed the event horizon. Um, and so, uh, um, as my wife reminded me when I told her the title of this talk, she, she, she made it very clear. She said, this is, you know, how, don't use the term woke, woke science because it's, it's an oxymoron. And that's exactly right. It is an oxymoron. But that's the tragedy. Therein lies the tragedy, because we are living in, a, in I, I will argue, in a world of increasingly woke science in a variety of different ways. Um, so I, I, I've organized this in a few dif different um, uh, subheadings. So I want to talk about the sort of examples of the sociology of science um, that are troubling, examples from the scientific infrastructure um, that are troubling, uh, examples of academic freedom that are extremely troubling in the context of science. And, and again, I'm going to restrict myself to science and I'm going to try and do it to the to as close as possible to to physics and and and, and but there will be examples from other things. And then uh, finally, the most concerning thing I think is the is perhaps the 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 the, the changes that are undergoing in the scientific enterprise as a result of this. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. So let's let's just go through. So starting with sociology, this was a tweet I I tweeted um, early this week, and 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 uh, and and I well, not that I cared that I lost four hundred followers, but it was the the anger and hatred and attacks on my character and history that resulted, which are kind of amazing, but they're normal now. They're for the norm. They're normal. You can't. Um, present something where people will just discuss the ideas, but they will attack you personally. But the, the concern here is this was an email I got from the American Physical Society. And it's and it's about it, it doesn't give any context of this email. It just says to, you know, we pretty producing some lesson plans. The intent clearly is to have a program that that encourages diverse interest in physics. And so it's the what can physics physicists do who can become a physicist, hopefully your students will see the answers can be everything and anyone. And if you look at this picture, you'll see that it's carefully, it, it, my, my reason for being concerned about it is that I think it's demeaning, but it's also patronizing. But nevertheless, this is not anyone and everyone. It's, 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 it's five women and, and a black physicist. And these are actually people I know, and I know a number of them who are very good physicists, but I think, feel that it demeans them to be chosen for their gender race. But you notice there are, what I pointed out was that there was some there wasn't exactly anything in anyone and and of course any group of six is not going to cover anyone and any everything but 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 that specifically doesn't there are no white males or no asians like a lot of people who 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 uh if you want to see what a what a collaborate what what it really looks like this is from the uh, discovery of the higgs particle at the large hadron collider one of the collaborations one of the smaller collaborations and you get a sense of what it really looks like and it really looks like it really looks like the, like a, a diverse group of people who were excited, and that and and they're and and, uh, and they're all been chosen because they want to work on a problem on the most complex machine ever created by human beings, and that was the driving motivation for this. You have physicists from over a hundred countries speaking dozens of languages, different religions, different ethnic groups. Doesn't matter. They produce 
devices that worked within a millionth of a, uh, uh, I'll use American uh, uh, units here, millionth of an inch and produce and work and discover the inner workings of nature because that's the driving force behind this. And if you wanted to present a picture that gave, that I think would show students that anyone and everything is doing a physics, physics, you might do that instead. So anyway, that's the American Physical Society in one sense. Um, the American Physical Society is the largest society of physicists in the world, over 55,000. Um, in June 2020, they endorsed a strike for black lives, organized in part by a group called Particles for Justice. And they shut, they wanted to shut down STEM in academia, and they did. Uh, at national laboratories and in universities around the country, that day classes were shut down, the laboratories were shut down, uh, science in physics, science was shut down for the most part across the country. The APS closed its office in, 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 in endorsing it, not to protest uh, police violence or racism, but to quote, commit to, a, this was right after George Floyd, but to quote, commit to eradicating systemic racism and discrimination, especially in academia and science, stating that quote, physics is not an exception to the suffocating effects of racism in American life. This is the kind of wokeness that is of some concern because there's no, this is a, a this is, I would describe wokeness as a religious attitude where the, where you assume the answer without asking the questions and it's her, it's heresy to even ask the questions and the question, of course, is what is the evidence of racism it, it, that racism is systemic in physics, but the no, no discussion of that the assumption is made that it's there and 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 uh, and woe be befalls anyone who who even questions that assumption that's the American physical society the dominant society of physics in the world. Um, the this is in, in December 2020 the American physical society sent out a letter to its membership arguing that Trump's presidential executive order 13950 on combating race and sex stereotyping was quote in direct opposition to the core values of the American physical society. What did the order talk about? It, they said it ordered the order needed to be rescinded in order to quote strengthen America's scientific enterprise. The order, which has since been rescinded by Biden, quoted Martin Luther King, stating that in government supported scientific institutions, people should not, quote, be, could not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. It argued in particular that materials from places like Argonne National Laboratory that equate color blindness and meritocracy with actions of bias, or from Sandia National Laboratories, which state that an emphasis on rationality over emotionality is a characteristic of quote white males and though and this argued that those were inappropriate training materials for government supported science institutions that order according to the american physical society was in direct opposition to the core values of the american physical society and it had to be rescinded in order to strengthen america's scientific enterprise so that's the that's what the the context of the sociology of of the scientific societies in which, uh, in my own field of physics, that um, we're functioning. It, but in academia, the same thing's happening. This is well known in Princeton on July 4th, 2020, more than 100 faculty members, including more than 40 in the sciences and engineering, wrote an open letter to the president with proposals to, quote, disrupt the institutional hierarchies, perpetuating inequity and harm. This included the creation of a policing committee that would oversee the investigation and discipline of racist behaviors, incidents, research and publication on the part of faculty with quote racism to be defined by another faculty committee and requiring every department, including math, physics, astronomy and other sciences to establish a senior thesis prize for research that somehow is actively anti-racist or expands our sense of how race is constructed in our society. So say in a mathematical physics department where you're working on uh, Calabi Yau manifolds in, in 11 dimensions, you have to argue how that is a actively anti-racist or expands our sense of how race is constructed in our society. Once again, claiming the, perpet the, the hierarchies already perpetuate inequity and harm without presenting any empirical evidence that there is, there are hierarchies perpetuating inequity and harm. The key characteristic of what scientific argument should really be, which is to base conclusions on data and policies on empirical evidence. Instead, the assumption is made and it's not questioned or not and not questionable as you'll see. And instead one has to act on it and only certain people can act on it. 
And in fact, the faculty committee that would decide what racism is, and you know that's a problem just waiting to happen. National Academy of Sciences, the sociology of this. Well, National Academy of Sciences, which of course of, in which is a group in which the average age is deceased, is nevertheless um, uh, uh, a group that primarily spends its time choosing members. And we're very proud to announce in, the, in 2021 that the half of the members of the class of 2021 were women. And this was not accidental. As described explicitly in a Science Magazine article on this, a major lever for change has been the Academy's governing council. It divides the new members allocated each year among six classes representing 31 disciplinary sections. We assign slots based on the diversity of the lists of nominees that they have forwarded. This is supposed to be the ultimate meritocracy in American science. Okay, we assign slots based on the diversity of the list of nominees they have forwarded. Wessler, who's a National Academy of Sciences Home Secretary says, classes presenting a more diverse list get extra slots for members. But she was, didn't think she was clear enough on that. And so what happens the next year, she said the next year, the council reviews how those slots have been filled in the last year and adjusts the distribution based on performance. Quote, if the selectors use them to pick a bunch of white guys from Harvard, they get penalized. That's how the National Academy selects uh, uh, people for the, in principle, the most meritorious position uh, 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 for scientists in the United States. Journals, of course, have come in. Science Magazine has become a very woke journal, as anyone who reads it and reads the uh, editorials of its editor knows. It's had since not 2019 promoted the notion that science is systemically racist and sexist. This year, they ran four pieces on physics in a single issue in which it was claimed that physics is racist and exclusionary, run by, quote, a white priesthood and, quote, based on white privilege. Mag Scientific American, which I used to be on the editorial board of, but no longer, it used to be a very prestigious popular science magazine, has become now merely a vehicle for social justice activism. And um, uh, um, a recent article, for example, and I'll discuss this, uh, this article, was cultural bias distorts the search for alien life. Heaven forbid we have our cultural biases distort our search for alien life. And you'll see how that comes into the, the way fields act in a moment. Okay, now let's talk about, in my mind, one of the real problems is scientific administration, is, uh, um, the, is the fact that administrators and leaders are perpetuating this, uh, this uh, woke climate, and, 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 and not only perpetuating, but enacting and, and censoring people who, who talk about academic freedom and question uh, current, uh, current uh, truths. Okay, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Francis Collins, who's an old friend, by the way, is the director of the National Institutes of Health, the largest single agency supporting scientific research in the country. Collins uh, apologized for the, um, uh, um, for the structural racism in biomedical research and pledged to address the problem with sweeping changes. He apologized for this again without it presenting any evidence that there had been such a thing. He did so at the behest of an advisory committee to the director, uh, the working group uh, report that called on the NIH to acknowledge the prevalence of racism and anti-blackness in the scientific workforce. Um, and uh, uh, so this is coming from the top. The top of the NIH is saying we are racist, structurally racist. Now, one of the things that I often think about this and uh, when I see this is if Francis Collins really believed this, of course, he should resign as director of the National Institutes of Health. He's been director for 10 years of an organization that's racist. She, he should, uh, uh, if he really believed it, he should, he should resign. But of course, he didn't. Instead, he wants to make up for the abuses that, uh, without saying what those abuses are. The Department of Energy. Um, we, you'll see this will become relevant in a second, but the, in May 2021, the, the Department of Energy, by the way, is the leading funder of physical science in the country. And President Biden nominated a woman of color, uh, Asmerit Asif, who's a, who's a reputable scientist, as you'll see in soil research, to lead the Office of Science, the largest funder of physical science research. It funds all national laboratories, all accelerators, um, uh, and, uh, and, and high energy physics as well. 
her work she's a she's not a she's never been a laboratory director was not does not work in the fields major fields funded by uh by the department of energy she's a soil biochemist her work is not related to any of the office's major physical science programs she's had no experience as a scientific administrator and almost no experience with the energy department what she did have however is have extensive experience working on diversity issues and she became the head of the department of energy office of science and you'll see later on what's happened to the department of energy office of science now let's go into academic hiring uh, sorry i see a typo but there anyway several years ago one began to see in all academic hiring for professor ads and postdocs as well but mostly faculty an additional criterion in advertisements for faculty openings one for cornell puts it also required as a statement of diversity equity and inclusion describing the applicants efforts and aspirations to promote equity, inclusion, and diversity through teaching, research, and service. This has now become a, 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 a de facto requirement in all, in all applications for faculty in the sciences. Uh, I went through uh, last year uh, 25 advertisements that come out in the fall in physics today from research institutions like Caltech to liberal arts colleges like Bryn Mawr, and even in areas as esoteric as quantum engineering or theoretical astrophysics. In those areas, 24 out of 25 required applicants to demonstrate an explicit active commitment, past commitment to the DEI agenda, not to their research, not to, these are people who've been graduate students largely with, or postdocs with their nose to the grindstone for the last N years, trying to do enough work to be able to get considered for a faculty position. And, um, and um, they have to, present that. Now you might think, okay, well, that's just another hurdle. That's just, you know, red tape. That's just something they put in there to, 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 so they can check that box, but it's not the case. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, a guardian, uh, for the doors of academia. For example, the life sciences department at the university of California, Berkeley reported that it rejected 76% of the applicants in 2018, 2019, based on their diversity statements alone without looking at their research records. So the first thing that they would do is look at the diversity statements. And if those didn't pass muster, you wouldn't even consider them rather than looking at the candidates on the basis of their work in life science, and then perhaps deciding whether you like what they said about diversity. Instead, this is the first step, gatekeeper. And as a, a colleague at a major research institution wrote to me, I have a student in the market this year agonizing more on the diversity statement than on their research proposal. And that's when he when is hearing more and more. In Canada, it's worse. I'm, I live in Canada now. I've worked in the United States most of my, almost all my professional career, in fact, all my professional career, but Canada doesn't have a, a, a constitution of, a, 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 and, and bill of rights that the United States does. And therefore it can do things that are are done de facto in the United States, but now, but in Canada, things can be done explicitly. For example, in Canada, you can have, this is an advertisement for a Canada research chair, and I'll talk about Canada research chairs in a moment, from the University of Waterloo um, in, in uh, climate change. And you notice that this call is open only to qualified candidates who self-identify as women, transgender, non-binary, or two-spirit. So in Canada, you can do that. In the United States, you can't. In the United States, you have to say it's open to anyone, and then you can, after the fact, you can ensure that only the people you want are hired. But in Canada, you can explicitly discriminate because uh, you're allowed to do that if you feel it makes up for past discrimination. Uh, the, ca this is not unique. University of Guelph had another Canada research chair in experimental physics. They said the successful candidate will be an outstanding and innovative world-class researcher in experimental physics whose accomplishments have made major, major impacts on impact on their field. That should be their criteria, of course, for, for such a distinguished chair. But in fact, candidates must be from one or more of the following equity seeking groups to apply. Women, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and racialized groups. So the first thing is to get the outstanding and innovative researcher, but only those who, who come from those equity seeking groups and the question of self-identification is not discussed. Queen's University recently advertised a research chair in geotechnical engineering that's open to applicants of any race, so long as candidates, quote, self-identify as women. Now, they, they actually apologized later. They said that this they didn't want to restrict it to that, but the rules of, uh, uh, but the legal rules required them to use the word women. They didn't want to, but they did. 
anyway, so as long as you self-identify as a woman, you can be considered for that uh, that uh, chair. At McGill, where where I, where I see Pat, where Pat is, is an ad for a tenure track position indicated that a, a demonstrated relevance of the candidate's work to addressing anti-black racism or systemic equity equities will be regarded as an important asset. So they're, they have to have done work that's relevant to addressing anti-Black racism or systemic inequities. A background in critical race theory is desirable but not required. What was the hiring field? Computer science, okay? Not sociology, not political science, not gender studies, uh, but uh, computer science. But the successful candidates work in computer science had to address anti-Black racism and systemic in inequities. Now, <clears throat> the Canada research chairs are, are, are important. I, I'm aware of them as a Canadian who worked in the United States and at times was approached about these. Canada research chairs were set up by the government to bring back, to try and raise Canada's profile by, by hiring the best people, not only the best Canadians, but the best expatriate Canadians and others and bring them back into the country to try and encourage uh, Canadians like myself who've gone to the United States or England or anywhere else to try and come back. Um, these are, these are uh, among the most prestigious chairs in the country, but now there are new rules. The new rules are, there are quotas on Canada research chairs. They have to exactly match the general population. By 2029, 50.9% of Canada research chairs must be women and gender minorities. 22% must be racialized minorities, 7.5% 7, 7 must be people with disabilities, and 4.9% must be indigenous. <clears throat> so now the, the selection of these things will be completely determined by, by quotas. Some university recruitment efforts, including in fields that have little to do with identity, such as quantum computing and computational biology, now flat out exclude white males who don't self-identify as disabled or LGBT+. Can, and, and forgive me, Pat, but can, this article said Canada's leading research university, University of Toronto, uh, recently announced that all recruiting for Canada research chairs will be restricted to the aforementioned designated groups in regard to engineering, dentistry, medicine, and various other disciplines. So uh, minority groups. So all of the research chairs are now closed to white males, Asians, and the like. Now, something of more concern is the question of, of wokeness and academic freedom. Okay, um, good. I'm working well. It, by the way, if it, uh, my my um, ability to hear you has gone away because I have this pumped through my ear, and and so um, someone can start waving if they want to if they want to interject, or else I'll have to change the way I, I hear this. Anyway, um, so let's talk about academic freedom and 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 wokeness. Um, let me talk about Steve, Stephen Hu, who I used to know uh, when I was back at Harvard. He was in the Society of Fellows with me. He, he was the vice president for research at, at Michigan State University. And the day of the strike for black lives, which the physics physicists uh, Particles for Justice had created, um, that they, one group used the strike for black lives to organize and coordinate a protest campaign against the vice president for research physicist Stephen Shu, whose crimes included doing research on computational genetics to study how human genetics might be related to cognitive ability, something that to the protesters smacked of eugenics. He was also accused of supporting psychology research at MSU, research that had appeared in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on the statistics of police shootings that don't that didn't clearly support claims of racial bias. Within a week of those protests, the university removed him for, as vice president for research. Thomas Sudlicki, from, from a, a well-known chemist from, from Canada, from Brock University, he produced an article in, in, uh, in, a, um, in a chemistry journal, a German chemistry journal on the state of organic chemistry synthesis in honor of the 83rd birthday of, of chemist Dieter Seebach. In the article, he questioned whether efforts to promote diversity by prioritizing inclusion of certain groups may be done at the expense of meritocracy. The reaction was swift and out following an outcry by offended social media mobs, the journal retracted the article, removed it from website and replaced several editors involved in this publication. He was censored by censured by um, his uh, his academic provost as well. And um, he recently died, but uh, they are, that article was removed. Alessandro Strumia is a physicist, a particle theorist who was from Italy working at CERN. 
the where the Large Hadron Collider is. On September 28, 2018, he gave a presentation at CERN's first workshop on high energy theory and gender, workshop on high energy theory and gender, and citing an analysis he had performed on data from Inspire, which is a, a, a website, a data site that's on uh, publications and citations. Um, he tested the idea that there is a gender bias against women within the academic circles of physics. He claimed that his results suggest that, in, that the males rather than female scientists were victims of discrimination. He also claimed there was no evidence of bias clearly against females from that data set. And it was a seminar with data. His subsequent seminar on the subject was canceled by CERN. His slides from the previous workshop were removed from the conference website and his position at the laboratory was revoked. It was condemned in a public letter entitled High Energy Physics Community Statement on a website called Particles for Justice by I think 4,000 physicists, um, including a variety of Nobel Prize winners um, um, for his, his, his data, data analysis, which could have been flawed, but there, there wasn't a question about his data analysis. It was, it was about uh, the conclusions based on his data analysis. Dorian Abbott, you probably know about this because it's got a lot of press. MIT's Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences canceled the, their prestigious Carlson lecture uh, because, because uh, Dorian turned out to have expressed a dissenting opinion, not about climate science, which is what the lecture was supposed to be about, but rather he argued in a Newsweek piece that universities' obsessions with diversity, equity, and inclusion threatened to derail their primary mission, the production and dissemination of knowledge. That Newsweek article six months earlier caused them to remove him from the lecture on climate change, a public lecture on climate change. Those are minor cases. Let me let me present two cases that are that are just terrific um, about prescribed research. David Porter, uh, Berea College, a small um, a Christian college actually, uh, which is famous for among other things uh, uh, making sure students don't have to pay for the college education. <clears throat> he joined the university after 30 years in the Air Force and, and also a stint as one of the leaders of the American Psychological Association as academic vice president and provost. And he stepped down after four years to return to the classroom as a tenured professor. He and his class developed a survey containing about 20 realistically, and that means ecologically valid scenarios, seeking to ascertain respondents' perceptions of hostile environments and judgments about academic freedom. Some of these were loosely based on incidents that had happened at the university, but, but the idea was to do a survey of people, to do a scientific study, and it was an undergraduate class to teach them how to, how to do this. In addition to the classroom development activities, Dr. Porter sent drafts of the survey to a dozen senior faculty members with relevant experience and received written feedback from six of them. Several said it was going to be controversial, but none voiced concerns about confidentiality, privacy, harm to participants, or any ethical issues. He amended the survey, nevertheless, in response to their feedback. Students in the course completed a draft survey and the results, along with their subjective feedback, helped refine the survey to focus narrowly on hostile environment perceptions and academic freedom. Standard survey techniques, such as a written disclaimer in the survey instructions, inclusion of diverse incidents from other times and places, and changing the race, gender, and relevant details of some of the scenarios minimize the exposure of individuals involved in those incidents. A final draft of the survey was sent to the Dean of the Faculty on the Friday prior to being posted on Monday morning. Dr. Porter was subsequently charged by the university with personal conduct which de demonstrably hindered fulfillment of his professional responsibilities. He was suspended from the college and his courses reassigned to other faculty members. He was prohibited from using or sharing data from the survey and communicating with students. He was banished from the campus and only allowed to visit his office with the dean's permission and informed that dismissal for cause proceedings would, against him would be initiated. The charges were not investigated by the administration. No students for the course were ever questioned as to the validity of the allegation against him. No evidence that he lacked either the professional knowledge or skills necessary to serve as a faculty member of the college were ever presented, which by the way, at that university is the only requirement for release from tenure. Nevertheless, he was dismissed from his tenured position for cause as a result of that experience. This is uh, Francis Woodison from Canada, Mount Royal University. The, the, the problem of asking questions. 
She attended a talk by Dr. Gregory Cajete, a, a, a professor of Native American Studies and Education at the University of New Mexico. In his talk, Cajete was discussing indigenous star knowledge and its important for educational institutions. She asked the following question, which was recorded. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on how this material with respect to astronomy could be incorporated into, for example, astronomy classes or other science classes. I'm not quite sure whether this presentation is looking at how indigenous people understood the stars and so on historically, or whether you think that this can actually contribute to existing science courses, especially things like astronomy courses. If you didn't have a telescope, if these cultures didn't have a telescope, I'm not sure how these stories would be able to contribute to the courses in the actual sciences at Mount Royal. Thank you. That's your question. In December 2020, this question became the su subject of a harassment complaint. At an arts faculty council meeting in March 2021, a colleague asserted that a number of Indigenous scholars had left MRU and he wondered how faculty members could make the university a safe place for them. Wittesen directed a question to the Dean of Arts as to whether saying that Indigenous science was not science made the university unsafe. Royal University listed that incident as one of the examples for why she should be fired. Your conduct at a meeting in the spring of 2021 was so disrupted that it was a significant contributing factor to the development of new procedures at the Arts Faculty Council meetings, as well as the disabling of the chat function during these meetings. She was subsequently fired from her tenure position. Now let's talk about, for me, maybe the most insidious aspect, not how scientists are being reined in or how culture of science may be changing more broadly, but how the content, if you wish, and, and functioning of science is changing. And that's perhaps really the worst, that's where woke science comes in, when the, when the way science proceeds as a discipline changes. And I want to give a variety of examples. This one from the Royal Society of Chemistry, a journal. The journal editors, a set of guidelines, announced that a set of guidelines had been produced by the Royal Society of Chemistry staff to help us minimize the risk of publishing inappropriate or otherwise offensive content. Offense is a subjective matter and sensitivity to it spans a considerable range. However, we bear in mind that it is the perception of the recipient that we should consider, regardless of the author's intention. So regardless of your intention, if you offend someone, it's your problem. And they told authors, please consider whether or not any content, words, depiction, or imagery might have the potential to cause offense, referring to the guidelines as needed. This is not for authors, for editors. The editors should consider that. Now, if you wonder what, what offense might be, they define it. Offensive content was defined as any content that could reasonably offend someone on the basis of their age, gender, race, sexual orientation, religious or political beliefs, marital or parental status, physical features, national origin, social status or disability, namely anything, anything, anything you say can be offensive and therefore not allowed to be published by according to the editors in the Royal Society of Chemistry Journal. Look at Nature, which have become increasingly woke. This is from the journal Nature Human Behavior and an editorial uh, produced by the editor of that journal saying science must respect the dignity and rights of all humans. She tweeted about this and said, individuals and human groups can be harmed not just through participation in research, but also indirectly by research that is about them. Research may stigmatize individuals or human groups. It may be discriminatory, racist, sexist, ableist, or homophobic. She said, some argue that we should evaluate such research only on the basis of its soundness and merit. I disagree disagreed so much that they instituted new rules. The journal will reject any articles that might potentially harm, even inadvertently, those individuals or groups most vulnerable to racism, sexism, ableism, or homophobia. So if it's interpreted that any scientific research might harm those people, even if the research was valid in any way, uh, it won't be, those articles will be rejected. And that's the progress of science. The Journal of Hospital Medicine, well, not a big journal, but nevertheless, it's kind of interesting. They published a piece in April entitled Tribalism, the Good, the Bad, and the Future, discussing the dangers to medicine of tribal in-group and out-group behavior. It sounds like a good article, an article you might want to read. The trouble is, the editors of the journal immediately retracted the article in response to social media reaction to these saying that the terms tribalism can be hurtful to some. They then removed all references. They, they 
rewrote the article, they removed all references to tribes and tribalism, including a definition of those terms that were provided at the beginning of the article, and then republished it, a revised version, and then wrote an editorial associated with it, apologizing for their act of microaggression in publishing it in the first place. Let's talk about grant control. This one I wasn't going to include, but Ivan, the, the group organizer, sent it to me, so I figured I should. I don't really know much about this. This is the Center for Advanced Studying Behavioral Sciences at, at Stanford, and they've created an ethics and society review. It will facilitate researchers in mitigating negative ethical and societal aspects of their research by acting as a requirement to access funding. And the intent is the following. So they argue that Past ethical reviews focus exclusively on risks to human subjects rather than risks to human society. We created an ethics and society review board, which fulfills this moral gap by facilitating ethical and societal reflection as a requirement to access grant funding. Researchers cannot receive grant funding from participating programs until the researchers complete the ESR process uh, for their proposal. So first you have to convince ESR people that you're not that your 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 work works within their contract context of morality, and then you might be funded. Of course, a recipe for disaster. But let's look at grant foundries more generally. Howard Hughes Medical Foundation, one of the largest funders of biomedical research in the country, announced a 2.2 billion initiative aimed at reducing racial disparity. They made that initiative possible by contracting its funding of significant research for senior investigators. So they took 2.2 billion out of the funding from their most productive biomedical researchers and instead aimed it to a, uh, an initiative to reduce racial disparity. It includes 1.2 billion in grants for early career researchers. Science Magazine reported that because anti-discrimination law prohibits disqualifying applicants on the basis of race and sex, but only because of that, the recipients will be chosen based on their, quote, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, in the words of the Institute's president, Aaron O'Shea. So $2.2 billion taken away from scientific research to, to an initiative that supports people on the basis of their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and not to, on the basis of their, of their work on biomedical research. The Department of Energy, remember the, the department that's now got a new leader, leadership, this year, now, they, as I say, they're the major funder of physical science in the country. Starting in fiscal 2023, every proposal responding to a solicitation from the Office of Science, every proposal, national laboratories, $2 billion neutrino investigation experiments, experiments looking at dark energy, experiments looking at fake wormholes that might be created in quantum computers, um, every, every proposal is required to include a peer plan which stands for promoting inclusive and equitable research to quote, describe the activities and strategies of the applicant to promote equity and inclusion as an intrinsic element in advance to advancing scientific excellence. In the words of the announcement, this can't be just, you know, a boilerplate paragraph in the middle of a 300 page proposal. The complexity and detail of the peer plan is expected to increase with the size of the research team and the number of personnel to be supported. So, a program that might ask to support a thousand physicists at the Large Hadron Collider um, uh, uh, will therefore have to produce incredibly intense plan showing how that research to, to explore the decay modes of the Higgs particle um, will, will, will work to promote equity and inclusion as an intrinsic el element of, an, uh, of enhancing scientific excellence. That's going to change the way, not only is it going to take time out for preparing proposals in uh, preparing the, the scientific arguments and basis of proposals, it'll take time for the researchers from doing their science. National Science Foundation introduced a new program. And this, when I first saw this, I couldn't, I couldn't parse the words. The title of their program is Inclusion Across the Nation of Communities of Learners of Underrepresented Discoverers in Engineering and Science. I mean, it's just gobbledygook. Of course, what it stands for, if you look at the acronym, I-N-C-L-U-D-E-S. So they had to come up with something that came up, made the word includes. They, the preface of this Gantt proposal begins by saying in 2016, the NSF unveiled a set of, quote, big ideas that identify areas for future investment at the frontiers of science and engineering. The big ideas represent unique opportunities to position our nation at the cutting edge 
of global science and engineering leadership. And it goes on and saying this program is part of that. And what we're going to do, how are we going to push the cutting edge of global science and engineering? It's to catalyze the STEM enterprise to work collaboratively for inclusive change result resulting in a STEM workforce that reflects the diversity of the nation's population. More specifically, NSF includes, seeks to motivate and accelerate collaborative infrastructure building to advance equity and sustain systemic change. This proposal, the discussion of this proposal doesn't talk about science at all. It doesn't want to talk about what science is going to be supported, what big questions need to be solved. What, it's, it's to create an infrastructure that somehow advances equity and sustains systemic games. Again, without any details of what that infrastructure can be, but of course, part of it is going to be create more diversity, equity, and inclusion infrastructure at universities. You can be sure of that. The nature of scientific meetings is being affected by the DOE. Beginning in 2023, um, all scientific meetings that are supported by the Department of Energy, uh, all proposals requesting funding to support a conference will require the host organization have an established code of conduct or policy in place that addresses discrimination, harassment, bullying, and other exclusionary practices. And of course, you can ask whether if you during a lecture, if you argue that someone's work is incorrect, if that's bullying. Also, applicants will be required to submit a recruitment and accessibility plan for speakers and attendees. The plan will need to include discussion of the recruitment of individuals from groups historically minoritized. I like that word minoritized in the research committee. So if you're running a conference on string theory, you're going to have to have a discussion of how you can recruit people. Uh, from diversity or, or, or what any area um, uh, and now so instead of instead of focusing on the content the, and the speakers who are most appropriate to the content you now have to look at that now there's prescribed research there's research you can't do we already saw one which is which was uh, David Porter's research in psychology here's another one John Cormandy who actually works in Canada in, in Victoria retracted an article intended for the publication of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from a preprint website. His article focused on a detailed, he'd written a book about this as well, detailed statistical analysis, statistical results related to the evaluation of the future impact of astronomers' research as a mean to, quote, inform decisions on resource allocation, resource allocation, such as job hires and tenure decisions. His intent was to say, too often we hire and promote without quantitative metrics, just on the basis of feeling. He wanted, and I, you know, he wanted to try and say, are there detailed quantitative metrics we can use for junior researchers to assess how they might uh, succeed later on? And to do this, he, he had a wide list of, of people throughout their careers looking at what they did as junior researchers versus senior research. Not research that I particularly am interested in, but he was, his goal was at least noble, was to try and make it quantitative. Online critics attacked Cormany's use of quantitative metrics, which may be seen as casting doubt on the application of diversity of diversity criteria and personnel decisions. And, and because of that, he felt the need to, uh, uh, he, to release an abject, I should say, an abject apology. Here's what he said at the beginning of, of, the, of, the, of his paper. I emphasize again, or somewhere in the paper, I emphasize again that metrics measure the impact that happens, not the impact that should happen. It helps us understand what happens in the real world. The real world is the only one that we live in. We have to live in. That would be a great statement if it were true. My hope is that healthy but not excessive investment in impact measures will make a modest contribution to better science. That was his intent. He, he was so harangued that he had, to, he had to write a Maoist retraction. The retraction was, I apologize most humbly and sincerely for the stress I've caused with the PNAS preprint the paper and my book using metrics of research impact to help inform decisions on career advancement. My goal was entirely supportive. I wanted to promote fairness and concreteness in judgments that are now based uncomfortably on personal opinion. I wanted to contribute to climate that favors good science and good citizenship. But intentions do not in the end matter, he, was, he realized. What matters is that is act, what is actions achieved. And now I see that my work has hurt people. I apologize to you all for the stress and the pain it has caused. Nothing could be further from my hopes. This, I mean, it's straight out of Maoist China. You've, now I see where I've done, done wrong. By the way, shortly at, at Michigan State University, after uh, Stephen Hsu uh, resigned, the authors of that psychology study 
asked the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences to retract their paper, not because of flaws in their statistical, statistical analysis, excuse me, but because of what they called the misuse of their article by journalists who argued that it countered the prevailing view that police forces are racist. I put two stars here to remind myself to say, as a cosmologist, if every article that was uh, distorted or misinterpreted by journalists was retracted from, from uh, journals, there would be no cosmology articles left in print. They later amended their attraction to claim conveniently that it had nothing to do with the political considerations, mob pressure, threats to the authors, or distaste for, distaste for the political views of people citing the work approvingly. Just to make, to make it clear that they only, re, they only retracted it because journalists were mis, misunderstanding it. Now let's talk about specific fields, and I'm almost near the end. Let's talk about archaeology first. Um, the Society for American Archaeology censored a talk by two archaeologists concerned about creationism creeping into archaeology, not, not Christian creationism, but rather indigenous person creationism. The scientists argued that the current Native American Repatriation Act allows repatriation decisions to be made on the basis of indigenous creationist stories in a com an accommodation that would not be made for Western-based religious myths. The society claimed that such language did not align with their values. Individual society members accused the talk of being anti-indigenous, racist, and part of white supremacy. So the talk was, was canceled and censored. Mathematics. Well, many of you may know about this white paper that appeared in Oregon and was going to be used as the basis for California's new uh, 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 curriculum in mathematics instruction. It's called a pathway to equitable math in instruction, dismantling racism in mathematics instruction. Okay. It was funded, by the way, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, partners including the Lawrence Hall of Science at UC Berkeley, among others. Here are some statements from this white paper. The concept of mathematics being purely objective is unequivocally false. We see white supremacy culture showing up in mathematics classroom, even as we carry out our professional responsibilities outlined in the California Standards for the Teaching Profession document. Using that as a framework, we see white supremacy culture in the mathematics classroom can show up when, quote, there's a greater focus on getting the right answer than understanding. Students are required to show their work in standardized ways. Independent practice is valued over teamwork or collaboration, and math is taught as a linear, in a linear fashion, and skills are taught sequentially. This is not arguing that these are pedagogically incorrect or, 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 or problematic. They are rather examples of white supremacy. Computer science. Google and, has created new guidelines for inclusive language in all their software and documentation. And they're going to be enforced in all future open source projects, and they'll scrub all earlier ver versions. And other technology groups, including some at universities and professional associations, have developed their own guidelines. I'll give you an example of the kind of prescribed, no longer the prescribed code language, the language that's now inappropriate to can no longer be used in coding. Word black box, the word dummy variable, because each of these somehow um, discriminate or offend. And one I found particularly interesting is smartphone. Somehow, smartphone offends <laughs> dumb phones, I guess. Um, and, uh, um, and then the Association for Computing Machinery recently engaged in extensive debates about whether the term quantum supremacy uh, should be used, which is, of course, the point where quantum computers will be able to uh, uh, solve certain problems faster than any classical computer in the, in the history of, uh, uh, of the universe. They're, they're debating that while China is actually trying to achieve it. Astrobiology is perhaps the most woke area of astronomy and physics. In the Scientific American article that I talked about earlier, Cultural Bias Distorts the Search for Alien Life, it was stated decolonizing the search for extraterrestrial intelligence could boost its chance of success, says science historian Rebecca Charbonneau. Instead of listening, so this is, instead of going out and actually listening for signs of alien intelligence, we should first be listening to indigenous people here on Earth, or she puts it, taking into account marginalized and historically excluded perspectives. So stop all that listening. And then at a, a large SETI meeting, which he was at recently, the group decided to forbid using the word intelligence, as in the search for intelligent life, as it is a white construct. 
astronomy. You may be familiar that the, with the fact that the 30 meter telescope has been blocked by indigenous protesters who view the mountain as built on as sacred. It's going to have a resolution 12 times finer than the Hubble Space Telescope, and it could, it's one of the major new telescopes in astronomy. But the key thing is not just that the indigenous groups, but the astronomy, but a large segment of the astronomy community has now come out in support of the indigenous groups. And it now means that this project has been delayed and it's not at all clear that the project will ever be built um, because of, of this uh, uh, concern among uh, these woke groups within the astronomy community. Now, let me end with physics. There's new funding for very important initiatives like decolonizing light funded by a major new frontiers and research funding group announced um, that that, that uh, initiative announced its commitment to studying quote the reproduction of colonialism in and through physics and examining how colonial scientific knowledge authority was and is still reproduced in the context of light. The description of the program was as muddled as you can imagine saying physics is considered as hard and objective science and therefore disconnected from social life and geopolitical history. This narrative both constitutes and reproduces inequality. So because it's hard and objective, it reproduces inequality and has to be changed. Here is a paper from, from Physical Review, one of the dominant physical reviews from a, from a program at, at uh, Seattle Pacific University. It was funded with a $2 million grant, I believe, from the National Science Foundation, observing whiteness in introductory physics. So using literature from critical whiteness studies and critical race theory, it uses these markers to identify and, ana and analyze whiteness as it shows up in an introductory physics classroom interaction. We name mechanisms that facilitate the reproduction of whiteness in this local context, including a particular representation of energy, physics values, whiteboards, gendered social norms, the structure of schooling. This is, I mean, it's, it's, you could, as I say, you couldn't make this stuff up, but this was supported by an NSF foundation and published after peer review in the physical review, the major journal in physics. I want to end with an example that is equally ludicrous, but perhaps gives an example for what I think is a, is a deeper problem. Recently, uh, the, 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 uh, dean of a division of social sciences sent an email to faculty to encourage you all to attend this exciting presentation by a visiting physicist. The, one of the physicists, by the way, who established Particles for Justice, an assistant professor at an East Coast University in physics and gender studies. The title of the lecture was Scientists versus Science, Race, Gender and Anti-Intellectualism in Science. I'll just read you the abstract. Black thought can help us free science from the white supremacist traditions of scientists. Scientists versus science will use black feminist and anti colonialist analysis to show that white supremacy is a total epistemic system that affects even our most quote objective areas of knowledge production. The talk hinges on the development of the concept of white empiricism, which I introduced to give a name to the way that anti intellectual white supremacy plays a role in physicists analysis of when empirical data is important and what counts as empirical data. The white empiricism shapes the actual knowledge produced about physics. Until this is understood and addressed directly, systems of domination will continue to play a major role in the practice of physics. This was based on a paper written by this individual in a journal, the Journal of Women in Culture and Society. And the title of the paper was Making Black Women Scientists Under White Empiricism, the Racialization of Epistemology in Physics. And the abstract basically very similar. And I think I'll, 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 I'll skip the abstract because I want to point out some of the paper, which to me demonstrates a fundamental, several fundamental misunderstandings about physics from this assistant professor of physics. Yet white empiricism undermines a significant theory of 20th century physics, general relativity. Albert Einstein's monumental contribution to our empirical understanding of gravity is rooted in the principle of covariance which is a simple idea that there's no single objective frame of reference that's more objective than any other. Quote, now, all frames of reference, all observers are equally competent and capable observing, of observing the universal laws that underlie the workings of physical science. There's nowhere in general relativity or in general covariance that, and it says that all observers are equally competent and capable of observing the universal laws of physics. That's just not a part of this, the theory. In string theory, we find an example where an extremely speculative ideas 
that require abandoning the empiricist core of the scientific method and which are endorsed by white scientists are taken more seriously than the idea that black women are competent observers or on their own experiences. This is the this is the nature of this. This would be laughable. This would be laughable, but let's see what's happened. And this individual is named by nature to um, one of the 10 people picked by the journal Nature due to their important contributions to science and society. Describe this person as a cosmologist that preserves the nature, preserves the nature of dark matter while also confronting racism in science and society. The American Physical Society awarded their Edward, Edward A. Boucher Award to this individual with the citation for contributions to theoretical cosmology and particle physics. By the way, this individual, so, uh, I would say, they're, they're con they're, they're, if you actually measure something like citations, they had, without papers that weren't conference proceedings, um, uh, had not only very few citations, but very few papers. But we'll, anyway, forget that. For contributions to theoretical cosmology and particle physics, and for tireless efforts in increasing inclusivity in physics, and for co-creating the Particles for Justice movement. They were awarded the award by the American Physical Society, but it doesn't stop there. For that gobbledygook that we just read, the National Academy of Sciences every year presents awards for excellence in science communication. They awarded their top award, their top prize for research scientists to this person who makes dark matter and astrophysics personally meaningful and fascinating for readers by blending physics and metaphysics in jaw-dropping and beautiful ways. Okay, now let's talk about how this kind of attitude might affect the future of physics. The National Academies, once every decade or so, produces a, a committee that examines uh, the future of the field. It helps federal agencies, policymakers, and academic leadership understand the future prospects for and societal benefits of particle physics research and make informed decisions about funding, work source and research, workforce and research direction. So the committee is made up of, uh, of numerous uh, distinguished people, Maria Sparopolo at Caltech, Michael Turner, former president of the American Physical Society, Chicago, um, several Nobel laureates uh, like Barry Barish, David Gross, et cetera. But you will notice that one of the the, the the junior member of the committee is the person who wrote that uh, white that that physics is not objective because of white empiricism and that um, and that we have to change the way we it, we do it because the knowledge produced by physics is not objective because it's based on white supremacy. That's the person who's going to be on the committee helping determine the future of physics. Well, that's my that's my um, data, and uh, I did do it in exactly an hour. Um, I just want to end with a with an example I learned from my friend uh, Anna Krylov, professor of chemistry at at uh, USC. When Anton von Leeuwenhoek's pioneering development of microscopy led to his discovery of spermatozoa in semen, he was concerned that communicating his new results might cause defense. As he put it, when communicating his results to the president of the Royal Society for publications in its philosophical transactions, if your lordship should consider these observations may disgust or scandalize the learned. I earnestly beg your lordship in regard, to regard them as private and to, and to publish them or destroy them as your lordship sees fit. In it, for 300 years ago, fortunately for the progress of biology, his lordship wasn't concerned about causing offense and his important results were published. Those were the good old days. Okay, that's, uh, that's my talk and now I'm going to try and set it up so I can actually hear you again. It, hopefully I can, people, if I can't, I'm going to have to take out the attachment to my computer and not listen to you through my ears. Well, okay. anyway, uh, I see there's lots of chats. And yeah. um, and so, oh, good, I can hear people. Thank, okay, thank so, you, Lawrence. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, we have questions. I think the first question is by Pat. Pat, feel free to ask your question. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, many thanks for your high level discussion. It is excellent to see the sort of the world known publishers of science, whether yourself or Dawkins or others, especially I think physical scientists talking about how bad the problem is and how wokeness comes in 
And we're apolitical. We're not supposed to be political. We're, so, we're the ones who are supposed to be saying there is an asteroid coming and that's about that. Otherwise we stay out of politics. And I think you're right that an asteroid's coming and I'm here to amplify your statements and give sort of a little story from the field here uh, for, the, for the people who are not familiar. I am a professor of chemistry at McGill working at the interface of chemistry and physics, which becomes important because I work in a field, two fields, a field that's more male and a field that's more female. What do you think the difference is? Do you think the more male field, which is laser science, is somehow more hostile to females and more sexist? And the more female fields, nanoscience and material science, is somehow nicer to women? I mean, that's preposterous. One is more involved with things, one is more involved with people. Ultra-fast lasers more involves things, and that involves really geeky, aspy guys. Material science involves people and solving big problems like energy that's more interesting to females. They do different things. Now, the irony of it is I just made my first scientific offspring, an assistant professor uh, who will be in a physics department, coincidentally. So she's a woman in physics, the hallowed thing. And so she does not want to be hired because she's a woman in physics. She hates this EDI stuff and wants to fight it. And I tell her, just get tenure first then fight it later. I'm already tenured, so I can fight it. But uh, so she hates this EDI stuff. She's a Swiss woman in Berlin and is a physicist and uh, so-called woman in physics. And she doesn't want to be hired because of that reason. I just graduated another PhD student this week, yesterday, I guess it was. And We're running uh, out of time, but... <laughs> sorry? Yeah, so We're I guess the point is, from the field, the student said he doesn't want to go into academics because he's a straight white male. So my question is, I feel like there's an enormous amount of problem that you're only typically touching the iceberg of. It's as worse as you could imagine, bad as you could imagine. And the people don't know what to do because they're afraid and beaten down. So what would you suggest to the people from the high level going forward? Well, okay, that's of course the, the, the important question. What can people do? I think I look, I think the answer for most uh, you won't like my answer, but I'll give it to you anyway. I think for the answer for most people is what they do already. They keep their head down and stay below the radar and just do what they what they what they focus on their own research and try not to have anyone get involved in it. And for many people, that's the right thing to do um, because that's what they can do. It is important that some people speak out what. What your statement that because you have tenure, you're safe about speaking out is, of course, not true any longer, but that's I'm glad that some people are speaking out. But I actually think the problem is so deep that individuals speaking out are not, not they, they're useful because they raise the problem. They they educate. And anytime you educate people of things, that's good. Ultimately, I think the biggest problem is the, is the scientific administrators, the heads of universities, the heads of 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 of. Uh, things like the DOE and the NSF, the heads of those institutions, those people have chosen the path of least resistance, which is to say it's far easier to cut and run than to, to, than to speak out because you'll deal with a, a, with a mob. Those people don't have backbone. They often try by virtue signaling to be out in front of the crowd, as, as Francis Collins was. Yes, we're, bi yes, we're racist. Yes, we're there's systemic inequity without ever asking, well, give I us evidence of that. that. There's, I think when we all think this of my generation and younger, uh, especially if you're, if you're neither white nor black as I am, there's a whole lot of old white men who've sold out everyone else. And they've really sold out young white men. That's who they've really sold out is young well, white men. A whole bunch well, I, I, of guilty old I, I, white men. And I'm in a battle, as you know, with my dean as an old white man yeah. who's in fighting me because I'm fighting EDI. And he says, you can't do that. So I've interacted with a lot of you got ahead that way. Well, I've interacted with a lot of university presidents and almost all of them are a disappointment and they almost all because they base they're worried about perception and funding, which is what's driving academia for the most part. I mean, funding, I mean, um, well, now national funding, but also donor funding are much worried about optics than 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 integrity. But I think ultimately my conclusion about this is that and I'm sorry if this depresses again, is that it's going to get much worse before it ever gets better. And the reason is that I think ultimately, if I look at, say, 
the, the blacklisting that happened in the 1950s and ask how that ended. Uh, I, I think ultimately it has to get to the point where every person who's in academia says, there but for the grace of God go I. It's not just these people, but I am under threat. And, and not only that, sees examples that are so ridiculous, so patently ridiculous, that they begin to say, hold on, let's step back. And when enough people do, and there's studies showing that when about 3% of any population become actively interested in anything, that's when that's when the, the, the sort of revolutions and perspective take place. But I think that's what's going to have to happen. And we're far away from that. And I think it's, I mean, as my last example of the National Academies, it's only going to get more ingrained and it's going to continue. And I don't see any simple solution. But I do think individuals need to speak out and present examples and be willing to be sometimes vilified for that. Anyway. Thanks for picking up. Anyway, thanks okay. a lot. Thanks, Pat. Do you want uh, to start? Uh, okay. Hi, was that me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Lawrence. I wrote a book about this. It came out this summer. Uh, and what you tell me, not much, even much worse than I, than I thought, uh, uh, the state of science. I had a couple of points. One is I re really can't understand where this new religion, because it is a religion, it's not based mm -hmm. on data, where this religion comes from. That's point one. Uh, why did it grow and so on? That may be more than anyone can answer right now. The second thing uh, is that uh, I remember commenting sometime, or people have commented, a scientist, a good scientist, is always uncertain. He's not sure whether this hypothesis is right, that hypothesis is right. But uh, these DEI folks, they, they have only one thing in mind. They have only one thing in mind. And on the other side are scientists who really want to get on with their science. They don't want to get involved in all of this. In other, in other words, it, it's a war in which one side is unarmed. One side is unarmed. The scientists are unarmed. So I think what's needed is, are organizations of scientists who are willing to give up their science and campaign against this absolute nonsense uh, that, we, uh, that we all have to cope with. Well, not so much me, I'm retired, but the people who are seeking grants, trying to find time to write papers and so on. Anyway, that's my comment. Well, let, let me let me make two comments based on that. First of all, I think it, it like many things, it still stems from good intentions. It grew out of good intentions. I was chairman of a physics department for 14 years um, and, and, and during which I was very proud to, in fact, to hire the first two women in our department. We tried to, we actually ha, uh, actually admitted an, uh, the first all-female class of graduate students. They didn't all accept. But, and the intent was, was hey, we should be trying to reach out. And it, it was sort of a good intent. And, and, but, but the point is that that's been going on for many years, even in the 1990s when I was chair of that department. As you're probably aware, every time I hired any Anytime we hired anyone, with that time wasn't a female, now be minorities as well, but anytime we hired someone who wasn't a female, we had to write a special um, uh, statement and explanation uh, uh, describing all the candidates that would go before the Dean's Committee. That was 1990s. The point is, the scientific community has worked very hard for 40 years to try and overcome what was clearly uh, a male hierarchy in the 1970s. That's when, you know, in the 1960s, women weren't even allowed at many of the Ivy League universities. That's the past, but it's it's the past. It's not the present. But the intent was to overcome that. And what happened is it created this hierarchy and this bureaucracy. And as we all know, um, bureaucracies perpetuate and grow. And I think what's what's happened is that's we know that's what's happened in universities, where the amount of money spent on DEI bureaucracies, for example, um, has has escalated far more than the amount of money spent on student support or faculty support regarding the, the fact of physicists you know scientists leaving and and creating an organization I, you know i used to i'm i as some as it was said earlier i spent a lot of my life trying to explain science to the public and be a public face for science to some extent and young people would ask me how can i do that how can i become a science meter and i would always say the same thing to them which was do good science. If you're a talented young scientist, you should be doing science. And, you know, I, and then you can look for opportunities to write. You can look for opportunities to write here or there, and those opportunities will grow. And the more and better science you do, the more and better opportunities will, will, will come up. And that's the kind of thing I feel like I, I, I don't want to encourage young scientists to do anything but to do science. 
But what some of them are going to have to realize is in order to continue the science they want to do, they're at some point going to at least have to stand up. But so it's fine for people. I'm retired too. It's fine for people like you and me to speak out. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, uh, and but it's important and it and it's incredibly important also that not forgive me if old white men speak out, but but people like my colleague Anna, Anna Krylov, that women and minority uh, fac faculty speak out equally strongly to say this is not helping anyone. And moreover, the policy should be based on empirical evidence. If there are problems, we should study and find out what the problems are rather than this religious attitude of assuming the problems exist and therefore we must solve them. David. Uh, yeah, first of all, Lawrence, uh, great talk. I learned a lot and oh, thank you. <laughs> pretty depressing, but uh, yeah, I learned yeah. a lot. Uh, second, I liked your your, react, your response to Pat about what should we do? And, and the answer, I the kind of what I took out of it was different people should do different things. Yeah. It's very much like I was very, uh, I testified against draft registration in 1979. And of course, Carter introduced it in 1980. And I actually tried to talk someone out of being a public opponent of draft registration, not registering. And he was very public and he went to prison. Uh, but he he thought yeah. it through and he thought that's my choice. And he was right. And different people will make different choices about that kind of thing. So I like that idea of let a hundred strategies bloom. My one question, and I under and I, I'm very sympathetic to your answer, no matter what it is. Oh, thank you. You <laughs> didn't mention the name of that person, and it took me two minutes of Googling to find out her name. And I'm wondering why. And I will be um, open to any answer you give. Well, you know, I I, I just want to because because I think the person is important, actually, okay. and and I think the the example is more important than the person. And I don't see any reason to focus on that individual. I'm not, I'm not commenting on her other, any, any other characteristics. Yeah. I just, I, yeah. I, I, I could, and, but I won't in this, in this forum. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and I don't, and I think the question was, was I, was I doing that because of, of being, being pre any internal pressure I felt? And the answer was no. I thought intellectually, what I was trying to do was use this as a as a case study, and the person was was unimportant. And I thought if I put the person's name, it would focus on the person. Um, okay, thank you. And and thank who's you. a very you know also no doubt I'm sure a very vindictive individual, but 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 uh, I I don't know for sure. But um, yeah. but let me just say regarding a thousand with the draft registration thing, I will say that my own activism throughout my life was actually influenced when I was actually a student at MIT. And, and first got to know Noam Chomsky, who's since become a very good friend. And his example of spending time speaking out, even when it wasn't popular, was something that I decided to emulate. And I think, I hope that that one of the good things with old guys like me speaking out now is that maybe some young people will similarly take that example. And Noam has explained to me that cancel culture is not new and he's been canceled for, for 40 years in so many ways. So, um, but he continues to speak out and I admire him for that. Yeah. Can I just add, uh, uh, that, that's a great answer, by the way. Can I just add that sometimes people compare this to McCarthyism mm -hmm. and there's no comparison because that's with right. McCarthyism, all you had to say was, I'm not a communist. Yeah. Here, you have to do way more than that. And well, so that was mild compared. Well, to uh, I would argue, I would agree with that, except for one aspect. It's the okay. virtue signaling aspect. It was not only did you have to say I'm not a communist, but you could say, but they're communists and they're communists. And I and, and they wanted you to speak out and say, who were the bad guys? And what you're seeing is the amazing response, especially of university administrators, as not just saying, I'm not racist, but but they're racist, and this is racist, and that racist, as a way of like Francis Collins, it's pure virtue signaling. I will yeah. say that there's racism to prove I'm not a racist. And that that aspect I think is is somewhat similar, but you're absolutely well, right. I, I agree, but there's a huge difference in degree. Parnell Thomas's committee, his House on American Activities mm -hmm. Committee, had that had what you talked about going on, but you didn't have every college saying yeah. denounce the communists. That's very different. But thank well, you. California, you see California, there was a lot of that. But you're right. Uh, uh, yeah. It, yeah. No, no, I I understand. And and um, well, anyway. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I I I think in some ways this is more pernicious because because it's so because 
it was never the policy of all of the academic administrators and societies and sci scientific leaders. It was it was being driven by by that committee and the people who could. This has now become a policy. All of these these unclaimed statements that are heretical to question have become the policy of the scientific establishment, and that's more worrisome to me. Right. Right. Thank you. Blundy. Right. I just recently learned that Robert Milliken had been canceled from the buildings at Caltech, and um, I yield my time to you to talk about that. Well, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of there's uh, the, the 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 Milliken at, at UC Berkeley, the ch former chairs, uh, the name of the, all those buildings' names are changed, and and you know what can I say? It's 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 this effort to somehow argue that. Um, that you can make a moral judgment about the life of a person that that is more important than their scientific com uh, 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 contributions and what's so ridiculous about that is that is that is that every is that you're going to have to ask people are you good parents are you good neighbors do you you know if you start adjudicating the moral base especially of people at a time which was different and you can say well you know racism was okay back then but it was never okay but the climate was different. But the point is, when the minute you start adjudicating people's contributions to science on the basis of their moral or ethical behavior as an individual in the past, then you're going to have to do that for everybody. And um, and and it's a it's a shame because um, well, you see what's happening. It, it, there's just no there's no there's no one who ultimately can survive that kind of scrutiny if you really care about it, ultimately. And so. Um, um, the, and it, but for me, the changing of the name is a perfect example of the way administrations, it's easier to change the name and be out in front. What do you lose? You lose a few people like you and me who say, well, you come on, or, or people who like Rob Milliken. But what do you gain? You gain the support of a vocal, active community and appear to be concerned about an issue which is clearly a big issue in modern society. So there's no loss. And that's the big problem with academia. There's no loss in getting out in front there's no loss in getting rid of a faculty member academic freedom it doesn't matter so much when you when you know so what do you do you 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 destroy the rights of an individual faculty member that's nothing compared to appearing to the community as if you care about people and you and you and you, and and their pain and suffering and that's why it's a it's a calculation that's perfectly reasonable it's a perfectly reasonable calculation that these academic administrators are making it's just the wrong one and it's and it, it's not based on any segments of any semblance of integrity, in my opinion. Thank you. I agree completely. Yeah. By the way, I I don't want to say anything about diversity, but it's been all male so far. I don't know <laughs> in the questioning. I don't know if if there's anyone. Yeah. Among... So um, we still have a few minutes, so I'll ask you a question that's going to sound a bit metaphysical, probably to uh, you, uh, <laughs> Lawrence. Okay. But uh, but I'm still interested about it because I heard a philosopher say that the kind of nihilistic uh you know irrationalism that you describe is sort of a self-inflicted wound by the west uh so his argument is that what the greeks called logos or reasoned right uh became computation right so which actually works perfectly in physics and in science but it might not be the right approach when you want to answer you know deep human questions uh or when you want to do moral philosophy so he his claim is that what we're observing now is sort of a the, the other side of the coin uh of, of this sort of process of shrinking uh you know knowledge and identifying knowledge or reason with computation and, and with technique, essentially. Does that make any sense to you or not? Not really. Um, <laughs> I, 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 knew, I, I knew it. I mean, I, yeah, no, I, I, I think the, the, the whole vert, the whole the strength of science is mm. that it is that it's the strength of science is that the quest, the que you ask questions based on trying to figure out how nature behaves and issues and and other issues are irrelevant and and the fact that 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 the world is describable by mathematics is a fact. It's it's you know one of the, one of the my favorite quotes, which actually is at the end of the book I just wrote, is by by Jacob Bernowski, a hero of mine, and 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 he he said you know it, it, you can't it, 
The world is real and whole. It's described by science. You can't play a game. You can't separate into camps uh, because it's just not the way the world is. And, 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 and it's an illusion if you do that. And, and so you just have to accept the world for the way it is. And, and it's mm -hmm. whole and real and science is a vital part of it. And whether you like the way it comes out or not is irrelevant. And I think that, so I think that that, 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 that apparent failing that your friend is quoting is in my mind, one of the greatest strengths of science. And, and just to be clear, I don't think he was questioning uh, the scientific method. What he was questioning is the notion that, for example, Aristotle, what, what he, what Aristotle was doing wasn't really uh, reason, or wasn't wasn't really rational, or wasn't really knowledge or meaningful knowledge, right? So, uh, so I well, think that was his his point. Well, uh, uh, well uh, let, let me let me go on a, a limb there. Also, I mean, Aristotle did do some good things. People have convinced me. Uh, over the last few years, because Aristotle <laughs> is a famous whipping boy, but but which is probably a term I can't use anymore. But um, uh, but let's face it, Aristotle said that men and women have different number of teeth. Why? Because he said that. Did he never bother to look in anyone's mouth? And that's why that wasn't science. And so the the the, the and that was the difference at that time. In my, they did amazing things, and Aristotle was an amazing intellect. But it wasn't science because science is empirically based. And that's the great discovery. And I'm a theoretical physicist, but science is based on experiment. It's not based on elegant ideas or wonderful people. It's based on nature and nature is the adjudicator. And so I think it's fair to say that let's let, you know, we shouldn't demean Aristotle's efforts and his remarkable human characteristics, but it's fair to say that what he was doing wasn't science in the modern sense, just like it's fair to, for that woman to ask but the question whether indigenous science was science. It, 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 and and so um, that's a that's a you know that's a that's a an academic question that has no pejorative sense or not. It's just a, it's just an academic question. It has an answer. That's mm -hmm. objective. Okay. Thank you. So there is also a question by Richard Sanders. So before we conclude, I'll let well, Richard thank, ask thank you. question. Thank you, Ivan. Um, and great talk, Larry. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. I, I, uh, Question and two comments. The question is: uh, it, Would it be possible for us to email you and get a copy of the of your PowerPoint, of your slides? Is there? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Valuable? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> late. I, I yeah. You're, as I was saying to Ivan, I was so I've been so, so attacked in the last week because of presenting that APS thing, that that I'm that I'm late. I'm just feeling shy. But yeah, I'm yeah sure. Yeah. Maybe if we execute a confidentiality agreement. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you can use it. Yeah. The question is what you want to use it for. But yeah, I I mean, it's knowledge, and I'm all in favor of yeah. knowledge. But and and for the you know and and I and my answer to the other question you know there are people's names in there but the intent is is examples of of, of facts that's all and I'm not making commentary on them, so. uh, Lawrence yeah. I publicly came to your defense on Twitter and the APS I, thing and I'm not even on Twitter I just yeah. did it just to defend you just for fun. I appreciate so there you go. it I, I appreciate it. it it didn't change anything all it does is rally. I've learned that it's best to ignore and move on but anyway well, so, um, so as, sometimes as actually that's not quite true I've learned that sometimes. You can actually can get someone who's who's incredibly antagonistic and change turn around by by response, which is not antagonistic. And then you know, actually, one person removed their post because I asked him a you know a sensible question, and we and and I basically said, "You seem sincere," blah blah blah. So it's possible, and my as my my friend Peter Bogosian would say, it's possible to have impossible conversations. I think, and we should all try and do that. So so as to my comments, I think I think you're absolutely right that the key is to get something like three percent of people in the field to mobilize and um, and maybe sign a common statement pointing to uh, you know the, the the wonderland that we've um, sunk into. And I think your examples are a great organizing tool. Um, I, I just want to add that I I, I think, Dealing with this ultimately is is going to require us to confront issues of race. Um, I'm a I'm a law professor. I'm at UCLA. I I, I know all about the origins of all this craziness because uh, critical race studies kind of uh, uh, started in many ways at my law school, and um, the folks who are in that field essentially feel that the affirmative action programs didn't work and they need to come up with another strategy and equity. EDI is the strategy. Uh, proportional representation is the strategy, and so I think we need to confront, uh, as scholars, these issues of race and and analyze things like, you know, is there discrimination in the award of of uh, 
of NSF grants? Is there discrimination in hiring? And if there's kind of efforts to document um, what we probably find, which is that number one, uh, there's a lot of reverse discrimination. And number two, um, that reverse discrimination is often counterproductive in, in people's long-term career trajectories. That will sort of undercut the intellectual foundations of this. And, and somehow I think we have to, we have to, we can't just sort of, uh, the, the outrage is very helpful, but ultimately we have to confront the intellectual foundations of where this is coming from. Oh, of course, certain people need to do that. And people like you need to do that. Um, and, 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 but let me just put a, a caveat to that. Um, people like what people like me can do, if, at least with any credibility, it seems to me, is talk about what's science and what's the and what is scientific process and speak out when something isn't science that's portrayed to be science or a process isn't scientific when it's when it's portrayed to be science. So, that I, you know, I can't I could, I suppose, I in principle have the capability to do a detailed research pro project and race, but I'm not going to. So I can speak out not to that. But people who are qualified to do this kind of research can and should do that. But the, but the caveat also is that research will not be read by scientists <laughs> and and um, and and it, it's an important intellectual contribution and it should be done by by people who can do that, I think. But the ultimately, it, 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 the only the only way that you're going to have, um, I think, change is, is if if scientists are speaking out about it because their problems they're experiencing with doing their own science or their colleagues doing their own science. And, and uh, you know, I just think it's the own, ultimately the only way. In fact, um, in fact, just you know, I should I'll, I'll end it quickly. It's where you have two minutes left, I guess. Um, for we many years ago, I was on some advisory committee at MIT about trying to improve the communication and writing for students. Um, and one of the things that was discovered was all the students had to take some writing course, but it was taught by some professor from column B who they had no respect for. OK. And what was discovered was if you actually in introduce writing in the engineering classes and the physics classes by the professors that people respect, because that's the disciplines they care about, it had much more of an impact. And for better or worse, I think, I think if the scientific union is going to change, in some sense, it can be supported by the intellectual inquiries that you're talking about. But ultimately, scientists themselves have to speak out, too, I think. I think maybe it's a good way to end. I think John has the last question. OK. Thank you all for staying around for so long. I, I, I'm impressed. Well, this is fantastic. Um, I would say I don't think this is fundamentally about race. Um, there's only so many minorities one can hire. And uh, if you just had a racial quota and got on with your work, things might be fine. This is fundamentally about politics. You read the DEI rubrics of what you have to do to pass DEI. It's not, oh, I'm just going to hire you know 50% Black kids or whatever. It's I pledge my allegiance to the DEI office. So it's enforcing. I think the enforcing of politics is the dangerous one. And in fact, as you mentioned, um, 10 years of this stuff has not budged how many actual minorities are in the sciences. It's just the pipeline so small. And, you know, in the end, not that many. It's just somebody's got to teach the classes and, um, you know, that you got to do what you got to do. Uh, so I think the um, the politics is the is the worst second to worst part, and the worst part, which you're touching on, is the censorship of actual research. It's okay if a lot of bad papers are written and a lot of mediocre people fill yeah. a lot of jobs, yeah. and we waste a lot of money. Yeah. So long as the top end of science can proceed, there's always been bad research. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but censorship on the top end of science, not being able to do uh, the best research, uh, that strikes me as the most important danger to sort of the country as a whole, as annoying as the rest of this can be. And, and perhaps we shouldn't spend too much time on, on this sort of annoying craziness uh, that just ends up wasting money. Okay, fine, we waste some money. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I, I, yeah, I think, that's why I tried to stress, you know, the context of the sociology and the administration at the beginning, but the threats to academic freedom and the actual scientific enterprise at the end, because those are the ones that I, I agree with you are, I think, are the most insidious and dangerous. Um, let me also say there are many examples I removed, but and I've gotten them in when I've written publicly about some of this. I can I can write publicly in the U.S. in the Wall Street Journal and then in other journals internationally. But um, uh, I get letters back from people that are amazing. Mostly, many scientists, by the way, write and have written me under pseudonyms from fake accounts because they're so afraid that if they agree, 
and it's on their academic account, they'll be held accountable for it. But but one of the one of the things was examples in not just science, not just in pure academia, but in in scientific laboratories like Sandy and other places, people were pointing out to me that they were requ were required to not only just pledge allegiance, but to study, take studies and go to classes on on a critical race theory as part of their job. And uh, and and so, you know, that that's that's a really uh, that's happening all over it's the place. It's not very inclusive to Republicans, is it? <laughs> or libertarian? No, and and let, me, let me let me point out, I mean, I'm, I'm always pleased that I get called a right wing pundit now because I'm extremely left wing. Um, in, in all of us, other er, 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 I came, I grew up in Canada, so by all American standards, I'm automatically left wing. And and, uh, and uh, anyway, thank you. And I hope um, I hope uh, that I haven't offended, but if I have, um, I'd be happy to hear the reasons why um, and have a discussion uh, because that's <laughs> what all this is supposed to be. And okay, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Lawrence, for a great talk. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you, I think, in a couple of weeks with the next uh, seminar. Um, if, if Lawrence actually shares his slides with me, I'll forward them to all of you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.